Tonight, the intensifying search for the missing after an unprecedented amount of rain overwhelms Nova Scotia. Four people presumed swept away by flash floods. We've dedicated a lot of resources today to help uh, find those families. Anxiety over the extensive damage. Our property is still submerged under about two feet of water. The mounting losses and the long road to recovery. <laughs> Thousands forced to flee the flames. It is horrendous. I absolutely have never been so scared my entire life. Massive evacuations in Greece making history. Plus, the plea from a dying prisoner. Well, my biggest fear is dying in jail. I don't want to die in jail. The call to take better care of Canada's aging offenders. CTV National News with Sandy Ronaldo. Good evening. The search for four missing people, including two children, has taken on a new urgency after torrential rain swamped much of Nova Scotia, turning streets into rivers and rivers into raging torrents. You can see the widespread devastation with bridges destroyed, roads closed, hundreds still stranded, unable to go home. And even though the water is starting to recede, levels are still dangerously high. CTV's Nick Moore begins our coverage with the calls for help and the heroes who came to the rescue. A military helicopter lowers a search and rescue technician into rushing floodwaters Saturday in Hans County. A stranded camper is lifted to safety. It has been one of several rescues that have been carried out in Nova Scotia from Friday evening on. Today, search and rescue crews were gathered in West Hans County. The RCMP say four people who were swept away are still unaccounted for. The last evening, our uh, RCMP underwater recovery team did locate a uh, pickup truck in which uh, we believed uh, the uh, two children were traveling in. Uh, the truck was unoccupied. Industrial pumping equipment is being used to lower the water level in the search area. We've dedicated uh, a lot of resources today to to help uh, find those families, sorry, um, we're, we're, uh, we're doing everything we can. Our heart, our prayers going, are going out to those families. As to the families, you, you have an entire province praying for your loved ones, safe return. Um, I know um, to, to Nova Scotians, I know so many of you want to help. Um, it's the Blue Noser way. Um, but again, um, given the treacherous conditions, the RCMP continues to ask people to stay away from the area. In Millbrook First Nation, a culvert on the main CN rail, which connects to the port of Halifax, has been washed away. A stretch of track hangs in the air. Usually this brook right here is a small little trickle of water, especially in the summertime. This is a, the only rail line we have going through here and uh, it's a total necessity. Repairing damage will take time, along with finding damage on bridges and roadways that might be hidden. You know, the road might look safe to be traveling on, but it could have been weakened by the floodwaters. Nick Moore, CTV News, Halifax. Nova Scotians are wonderful at storytelling, and today some shared with CTV's Hafsa Arif where they were and what happened to them when the rain came fast and furious. It was a heart-pounding ordeal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jody Stewart and her two kids were on the third floor of their condo building in Bedford when they heard this fire alarm. It was super loud, so we knew that something was going down. Um, so we just collected what we could. They're among 200 households displaced in the Halifax area. But the loss of belongings and a home is a circumstance the family is all too familiar with. From Hamas Plains fire, so this is still the turkey lost her um, home in the fire. Um, and then to have her Bedford home um, under, you know, water. In the wake of the disastrous flood, Amber Anderson was living in a makeshift tent. Well, I came back late to my tent that night and I was already underwater, so I kind of stayed in my tent as much as I could. She remained in her tent as she waited for a break in the downpour before going to a comfort center. Anderson's already living without a roof over her head and now she's lost what was left of her belongings. And it just seems like the world's trying to keep me from even keeping clothes on my back and any kind of shelter. 
While locals at this comfort center determine their next steps, cleanup is well underway around the city. The storm had swept through the ceilings of the Bedford Mall, causing flooding within the property. While the water on the parking lot has receded, the parking lot remains largely underwater. Yellow tape, barricades and road closures continue to be a reality around Bedford and parts of Sackville, as most of the water levels remain the same. This family is already working on repairs to their basement. We have a flooded basement and I don't have any insurance coverage on it, uh, and so we've just had people coming in uh, doing everything that they can to help out, lending fans, lending dehumidifiers. There's still several hundred customers without power in the Halifax region particularly in the Bedford and Lower Sackville area. A heart-pounding ordeal with a difficult road ahead for many. Hafsa RFC-TV News, Halifax. Well, after soaking mainland Nova Scotia, the storm tracked east to Cape Breton. Sheets of rain pounded Sydney overnight and into the morning. By noon, it stopped. Most islanders fared better than those on the mainland. Some flooded basements, some sewer backups. Very sporadic, though. No one particular area was, it was hit more than others. By day's end, Cape Breton had recorded some 160 millimeters of rain, roughly half of what fell in Halifax in 24 hours. Now, the system that soaked the Maritimes is on its way out, but on the other side of the country, lightning strikes from passing storms have sparked new wildfires, leaving several B.C. communities on edge. A 4,000-hectare fire near Kamloops has sent residents fleeing. And farther east in the Kootenays, an out-of-control wildfire near Cranbrook has forced hundreds from their homes and left others ready to leave with a moment's notice. CTV's Tyson Fedora reports. Although a blue sky high in the mountaintops near Sparwood, B.C., the Ladner Creek wildfire is slowly growing in size. But it's nothing in comparison to the 4,093 hectare fire along the St. Mary River north of Cranbrook. I'm all packed up and ready to go. <laughs> what a difference several hours can make. A dark and smoky sky Friday is now clear. Wassa Lake's Murray Dyer says he saw the fire glistening in the mountains for several days, but was handed an evacuation alert notice by officials Saturday, being told he may have to leave at a moment's notice. But right now it's on the other side of the river. As long as it stays on that side of the river, we're okay. If it jumps, well, guess we're going to be going next. <laughs> Down the street, Warren Atkins owns the local diner. With thousands of dollars in food and materials, he remains hopeful the power will stay on. We've watched the fire grow from, you know, like if you go to Cranbrook and back a lot, you see, you've seen it, how far it's moved. And, and we've had smoky days, not so smoky days. Like today, it's nice and clear. But by tonight, that could change. BC Wildfire Service's 232 personnel are battling the blaze along with eight helicopters and 16 pieces of heavy equipment. Overnight crews say control lines were held. The fire does still have the potential to grow. That is why it is listed as out of control, and it is why these evacuation alerts and orders are um, still on. The cause of the fire remains under investigation, but officials suspect it was the result of downed power lines. A big gust of wind comes up and flares it up again. That's what everybody's scared about. <laughs> 661 homes in the regional district of East Kootenay remain on alert while 67 are on evacuation order, with residents remaining cautious of their next steps. We'll play it by ear and see what happens. Hopefully we don't get to an order and we don't, and hopefully we don't lose power. That's the big thing. If we lose power, that's, that's when you have to start scrambling. Tyson Fedora, CTV News, near Cranbrook, British Columbia. Well, tourists are scrambling to get out, some fleeing for their lives, as more than 80 wildfires rage in Greece. The most serious is on the picturesque island of Rhodes in the Dodecanese region. More than 19,000 people have been moved away from the danger zone in what's being described as the largest evacuation in that country's history. CTV's Jill Makashan has the latest. The beauty of the island of Rhodes, part of it now in ruins. Seaside villages destroyed, once bustling hotels silhouetted by fire as thousands of people escaped to safety. We were in the pool and about three o'clock in the afternoon we could see flames coming over the top of the, the forest in Rhodes. Those who couldn't be taken to the mainland were housed on safe areas of the island in schools and gymnasiums. This man arrived by plane as the wildfires raged. This is where we come to here. This is our hotel. Been here since midnight last night. Uncomfortable for tourists, 
utter loss for the people who live here. <laughs> My house, she says, please save us. Dozens of homes have burned. There are reports at least three hotels have been destroyed. As fire officials brace for more rescues, they are calling the one overnight historic. <laughs> This is the largest undertaking of safe transport of residents and tourists that has ever been carried out in our country, he said. Hundreds of wildfires are burning across Greece as the country wilts under the heat. In Athens, where it was 44 degrees today, visiting hours for the Acropolis and other archaeological sites have been revised due to soaring temperatures. This summer could break a record for the country's longest continuous heat wave set in 1987 a heat dome that extends across much of southern Europe. In sweltering St. Peter's Square Sunday, the Pope urged world leaders to do more to control climate change. It is an urgent challenge and cannot be put off. It concerns everyone, he said. Let us protect our common home. Canadian tourism companies are telling CTV News tonight they're getting some calls to postpone vacations to Greece, but no cancellations yet. That may depend on how long the heat emergency overseas continues. Sandy. All right, Jill, thank you. The Greek consulate in the southern Ukrainian city of Odessa was one of dozens of buildings hit in a Russian missile attack. At least one person was killed and 20 others injured, including four children. As CTV's Judy Trin reports, an Orthodox cathedral of great historical importance was also heavily damaged. An early morning attack on the sacred heart of Odessa, striking the Transfiguration Cathedral. Ninety years ago, the church was destroyed by Bolsheviks, but rebuilt after Ukraine gained independence. Now it's in pieces again. <laughs> Why did they hit the shrine, asked this woman, while her husband says he feels pain in his soul. Officials say 50 buildings in the city were hit. President Vladimir Zelensky called it a terrorist attack. They're targeting our humanity and the foundations of our European culture, said Zelensky. As workers cleared rubble in Odessa, Vladimir Putin visited a church with his Belarusian counterpart. Earlier, the two presidents claimed the Ukrainian counteroffensive was failing. Ukraine has had difficulty repelling the attacks on its port cities, which intensified after Putin refused to allow cargo ships of grain to pass through the Black Sea. And a stalemate has descended on the Donetsk region. Ukrainian soldiers have suffered high casualties from Russian cluster bombs. But Kyiv's biggest ally says there's progress. It's already taken back about 50 percent of what was initially seized. Now they're in a very hard fight. Uh, to take back, uh, to take back more. To do that, this political science professor says Ukraine needs more weapons. The West needs to significantly increase the supply of weapons, and particular ammunition to Ukraine. And we also need to greatly augment our ability to produce that ammunition. This week, Ukraine began using its new supply of cluster bombs provided by the United States. But the promised delivery of F-16 fighter jets won't take place until the fall, and it could take months before pilots are trained to fly the warplanes. Sandy. Judy, thank you for this. And Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he will be back at work Monday for a key vote, despite being fitted with a pacemaker during emergency heart surgery over the weekend. Tens of thousands protested again today against the planned weakening of Supreme Court powers. The contentious judicial overhaul has ignited seven months of mass protests and international concern for Israel's democratic health. Politicians are voting on the first part of the legislation tomorrow. Coming up, a prisoner's plea. I don't want to die in jail. I'd like to get out. I'd like to enjoy what little life I have left. Aging and ailing offenders call for medical clemency. The case of a terminally ill federal inmate is putting the spotlight on how the system treats aging offenders approaching death. Ed Spidell doesn't want to die in prison, but because he hasn't been granted parole, he's asking for a medically assisted death. Spidell spoke to CTV's Avis Favreau. 
Inside this federal jail in B.C. is 62-year-old Ed Spidell, serving a long sentence for a variety of robberies and other crimes. But he's dying of end-stage lung disease. His lungs are working at just 19 percent capacity, and he needs oxygen 24 hours a day. I have days where I have a real hard time breathing, and it's like choking. Yeah, like you're starved for air. Last year, he applied for parole. It was rejected. My biggest fear is dying in jail. I don't want to die in jail. You know, the robberies and the escapes, and I, I didn't have any self-control, but uh, I've done 41 years. I think I've done my time. His lawyer has filed an appeal, with his doctor also urging that Spidell be given a compassionate parole. But that case was rejected, too. For the vast majority of people, if you are terminally ill, um, what, what risk do you really pose? Surveys show that 26 percent of federal prisoners are over the age of 50, many developing chronic health problems linked to age. With a report from 2019 finding that prisons are becoming de facto nursing homes. We saw an inordinate uh, amount of prisoners who were either terminally ill, palliative, uh, had dementia, Alzheimer, who were even bedridden, you scratch your head, uh, saying, what are they doing in a, in a prison setting? Experts say that prison officials should look at what's happening in other countries, where they're creating secure halfway homes that operate like nursing homes, with better care at a cost two to four times less than prison. But there are less than a handful of such facilities across the country and over 1,700 elderly prisoners in federal jails. In an email to CTV News, Correctional Service Canada writes that it will continue to work with community partners to address the needs of older persons in custody. Ed Spidell, meanwhile, has applied for a medically assisted death, which he says may come faster than an approval for a compassionate release. It looks like it's easier to kill myself here with their help than it is to try and convince them to let me back out offering his story to raise questions about how Canada will deal with those growing old behind bars. Avis Favreau, CTV News, Toronto. As we go to break, U.S. Customs agents in Texas knew something didn't smell right when they stopped a pickup truck loaded with four wheels of cheese. It could be brie, mozzarella, take your pick. After a detailed inspection, they found eight kilograms of cocaine hidden in the cheese the vehicle and drugs were confiscated, and the 22-year-old driver, a U.S. citizen, is facing smuggling charges. Still ahead, happy 40th anniversary. The Air Canada flight that ran out of fuel and glided into history. It's been 40 years since an Air Canada jet made an emergency landing, gliding to safety in an abandoned Air Force base at Gimli, Manitoba, after running out of fuel. It could have been a disaster. Instead, the story of the Gimli glider has become the stuff of legend. CTV's Taylor Brock explains. On July 23, 1983, Air Canada Flight 143, piloted by Bob Pearson, was flying from Montreal to Edmonton when one by one, the aircraft's fuel tank alarms went off. So now we're, we've got these lights coming on and I said, Morris, uh, I don't understand what's going on. Pearson and his co-pilot decided to make an emergency landing in Manitoba. It was all hands on deck as Pearson and traffic control in Winnipeg figured out where to land. Calling volunteer fire departments, calling the RCMPs between Red Lake and Winnipeg. Then Pearson's engines and radio cut out. There was a loud bong and the cockpit went black because all the instruments were, were run off the electricity generated by the engine. The plane silently glided into Gimli. It was here at a decommissioned airstrip where the plane crash landed. Art Zook and Carrie Seabrook were two of the only three witnesses on the ground. It wasn't until after the plane came to a stop and we saw smoke and flames and people evacuating from the plane that we realized, oh, this shouldn't have happened and this is potentially dangerous. Then a nearby pilot told traffic controller Terry Arnold something he's remembered for 40 years. And he says it looks like it and there's people running like hell from the airplane. And then we were elated. Everyone walked away from the crash. 
What went wrong? The fuel wasn't being measured in the metric system. I found out a few days later those numbers were pounds per liter, which were being used on the other airplane. Every year since, the town remembers the heroic landing, and little did Pearson know, 30 years after that landing, he'd meet his future wife Pearl at a Gimli glider event. She was a passenger on his plane. Taylor Brock, CTV News, Gimli. <laughs> After the break, going for martial arts gold, a young girl's goal of achieving chi. We leave you tonight with Sarah's story. Her goal is to be the best she can be in whatever she puts her mind to, whether it's music or martial arts. And according to her sensei, she's a star. CTV's Adam Sawaski reports. For my routine. Well, Sarah Nolan is completing her morning routine. Brush, do hair, eat breakfast. The 15 year old is anticipating her daily activities. Busy, busy, busy. And if her daughter's schedule is not jam packed full of possibilities, then she'll find something to keep her busy. Perhaps practicing her favorite Disney song, knitting something cozy, or coloring something cheerful. She has to work so hard just to do the mundane things. Yet Down syndrome never stopped Sarah when she was waiting in the lobby for her siblings to learn karate and started imitating their moves. The policy is integration, not segregation. So Sarah started training with Richard Mazda, who says her positivity earned the respect of the whole class. That internal motivation to want to keep trying was really amazing. Over the next seven years, Sarah practiced daily and eventually placed so well at the regional and provincial level against athletes without disabilities that she recently earned an opportunity to compete at the nationals. It was kind of scary at first. It was scary at first, Sarah says, as she wore a new karate uniform that her fellow classmates had pooled their money to buy for her and began performing. You could see her heart was beating, absolutely. But Sarah overcame the mental and emotional pressures, completed the kata routine with accuracy, confidence, and grace, and won gold. Yay! Why, Sarah! Lots of high fives. I saw a little tear in her eye, and boy, tears came in my eyes. Sarah's next step is training to qualify for Team Canada with the hopes of competing at the Paralympics in 2028. But before that, she's crediting her karate community and family for her success and offering this advice. Be confident and do what I have to do. Be confident and do what you have to do, Sarah says, and you too can overcome whatever adversity is facing you. Adam Sawatsky, CTV News, Saanich. And that is our newscast for this Sunday. Thank you for sharing your weekend with us. I'm Sandy Ronaldo. Omar is here Monday. Have a good night, and I will see you soon.